chemical weapons again. Hundreds of thousands of people fled to the snow-covered mountains on the borders of Turkey and Iran, where they ended up stranded, facing death from exposure, malnutrition, and disease. It seemed that all hope was lost when the United Nations passed Resolution 688, demanding that Iraq stop its oppression and allow humanitarian relief. On April 6th, the United States declared a no-fly zone, and days later, Operation Provide Comfort began. These vital decisions shielded Kurdistan for the next decade and enabled us to establish a stable and peaceful region that we can all be proud of today. It is important that we recognize the sacrifices of our people at that time, the lives that were impacted, the loved ones who died on that terrible journey and were buried hurriedly along the way. It is also important that we appreciate the Peshmerga and the leadership of Kurdistan, which at that time was known as the Kurdistan Front. Some of the leaders who played a role then are sadly no longer with us. For example, President Jalal Talabani, Mam Jalal. But of course their role is not forgotten. Before we continue, I would like us to watch a very short video produced by the media partner to this event, Grudal Media Network. This film illustrates what happened in 1991. Let's just watch this short film and then we can return. Slow resin bu bajdar won binaroni bares zor khush halam ka bajdar dabam layat kirnawai Sihamin Salyadi My apologies. Uh, it looks like we had a, uh, some problems in the control room. Uh, we were expecting to see a short film produced by Rudal that looks at After the, the events in the Kurdish areas of Iraq, in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, Saddam Hussein's forces launched an attack on areas liberated by the Kurds. Jag är väldigt glad åt att den här konserten har kommit till stånd igen. Håller han formen, Lasse? Ja, jag tyckte han såg pigg ut. Ungefär som han såg ut för 20 år sedan. Det är inte dåligt. Här är det kontraster. Hundreds of thousands of families fled through the treacherous mountains to find safety from the Iraqi army's persecution, camping in below zero temperatures without food or water. Its mother couldn't reach medical help in time. Thousands died over the next weeks and months of disease and malnutrition. In Paris, a French cabinet minister, Bernard Kushner, said he feared a colossal number of deaths. On April 5, 1991, after receiving letters from the representative of France, Iran and Turkey, expressing their concern over political repression, the United Nations Security Council condemned the Iraqi army's actions. As a result, the Security Council adopted Resolution 688. France, the United Kingdom and the United States used Resolution 688 to establish a no-fly zone to protect humanitarian operations in Iraq. Sources say the aid is part of an informal dialogue between the U.S. and Iran. They hope it could eventually result in the release of Western hostages. FD, the Associated Press correspondent, said many people appealed to foreign reporters for assistance. He quoted a young woman in Geneva as saying, We need help. 
The helicopters are killing us. We have no food. With our thanks to Rudal for that uh, short video. Today on this special occasion, we are grateful that so many distinguished speakers will be joining us to mark this anniversary. Some of them were Kurdish or American political or military leaders and decision makers at that time. Others represent the United States government today. We are truly honored that we will hear remarks by His Excellency President Masoud Barzani, who was at the heart of these events in 1991. We will also hear from Mr. James Baker, who was the US Secretary of State at the time, and Kakushyar Zebari, former Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Iraq, who was, of course, in the opposition to Saddam in 91. From the United States government, the Biden administration, we will be joined by Brett McGurk, the coordinator for the Middle East and North Africa at the White House National Security Council. From the Department of Defense, we will hear from Dana Straw, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. In the final section of our event today, we will be joined by three remarkable men, General John Abizaid, General Jay Garner, General Jim Jones, each of whom played a pivotal role in implementing Operation Provide Comfort. Today, the United States and the Kurdistan region are partners, and we have shared values of respect for democracy, human rights, and religious freedom. Kurdistan is fortunate, fortunate. Kurdistan is fortunate that we have bipartisan and widespread support in the United States Congress. I am pleased to announce that the co-chairs of the Kurdish American Congressional Caucus have introduced a resolution in the US House of Representatives to commemorate the 30th anniversary of Operation Provide Comfort. The resolution ends with this line. The Congress hereby reaffirms the strong US-Kurdistan partnership and our enduring respect and support for our Kurdish allies who courageously stand shoulder to shoulder with the US in our shared opposition to extremism and terrorism. We thank all the members of Congress who have consistently supported the people of Kurdistan and especially members of the Kurdish Caucus. Now we will begin to hear from our distinguished speakers, beginning with His Excellency Masoud Barzani. We are grateful that President Barzani is delivering remarks on this occasion, recognizing that Operation Provide Comfort was the end of a dark chapter in our, in our history and the beginning of a new, brighter one. Now we will see His Excellency's message. Slow reason book, Bajdar Wonu, Binaroni Bares, Zurkush Halam Ka, Bajdar Dabum, Layat Knaway, Sihamin, Soliadi, Damas Randini, Noche Aram, Kamayat Knaway, Rodovic, Zurzur, Gringu. Gaurela Mejuda Also Geli Kurdistan Tushi Karasati Gaurava Tabu Kuchravi Milionibu Hamukal Kurdistan Ruila Snurakani Iran Turkey Kurdabu Chungarjemi Iraq Dwai Tekshkani La Kuwait Badahawa Sudi La Chan Kalene Kwargir La Tifake Safwan پاشماوی جیشکی با کاری هینا بو سرکت کردنی راپرینی خلکی باشور و هر وها سی فرقی حرز جمهوری هینا بو کردستان او کاتا خلکی کردستان ترسی اوی ها بو که جاری که تر انفال بکرین و کیمیا باران بکرین همویان کوچیان کرد و رویان کرده 
سنورکانی ایران و ترکیا پشمرگش نه هزه کی و گوره هبو او وقتا نه چکه کی وای هبو بلام قارمانانه برگیریان کرد و لزور شوین توانیان پشروی سپای عراقی بوستینه با درجه های میجو ظلمه که زور لگل کردستان کرده بلان لسالان دوائی رجیمی بعض حکم رجیمی بعض کارساتی گوره بسر گل کردستان دهاد وکو انفال کو ملکوژی کیمیا باران اما بو بریاری شستات و هشتا و هشت و بریاری دوبین کردنی نوچه آرام در فتح کی زیرینی رخصاند بو گلی کردستان و او مترسیانه تا حد ایکی زور نمان تر خلکه که گرای او بو سر مال و حالی خویانو و لیره دم دموه با بیر جنوبی جیمز بیکر وزیری دروی امریکا بینم که لسالی لبو هاوینی از سال زار و نوصات و نوات و دو که وقت وفدی معارضه ما لچوین واشنطن و لوزارت در و پیش وزیل کردین باسی هستی خوی کرد که حاطب و بسردانی او اوارانه لسنوری ترکیا گوتی او دیمانانه بینیم حتی ما هم لبیرم ناچی و اونده دلتزین بون چاوروانیم نکرد تا بگه مشوین خوم هر لنو فروکه پیواندیم به سرو بوشه و کرد و دوام لیکر هر چی زودتر کار یک بکریت نم خلکه بگره تا و بوسر جگه خویانو و پارز راو بر لیره دام به پیوستی دزانم سپاسی سروک بوشو سروک میترانو مدام میترانو سروک وزالو سروک وزیران جون میجر کم با او هلوستیان و او بریاره بویرهان و دوی او اگلی کرسان توانی اداره خوی بکد دامو دزگاه شرعی دا مزرینی حل بجاردنی کرد پرلمانی دا مزراند حکومتی هریمی دا مزراند و کردستان بو و پناگایک بو همو لقوموان و تیکوشرانی مراق هروها من با پیوستی ازانم سپاسی جنرال گارنر و او افسرانه که او وقت لگلی بون جنرال جیم جونز جنرال جون ابی زید کلونیل ناب و هروها همو او افسرانه ای ولاتانی ترکه ها پیمان بون و هاتن نوشه آرامیان دام از راند اما تا ایره والله مستش گلی کردستان نگشت و به همو آمان جکانی و به قناغی کتایی هشتا متر سیزور گورهی علی سر حریمی کردستان دواکارم او پشتیوانی او او پشتگیری بردوان بید و دواکارم پاراستنی خلقی کردستان لأولویتی ای و دابی جاره که تر زور زور سپاس سپاسی نوینه رتی حکومت هره میجده کم بو رخصاندنی هم در فتح سپاس Thank you so much Your Excellency It's such an honor to have this powerful message from President Masoud Barzani And now it gives me a great pleasure to welcome two distinguished gentlemen who have remarkable careers in public service. Uh, I would like to welcome His Excellency, Mr. James A. Baker III, who has had an extraordinary career in public service, having served in senior government positions under three United States presidents. Also joining us is Kakoshiar Zebari, who, as we all know, has a distinguished career in Kurdistan, and has also served as Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, Finance Minister and Foreign Minister of Iraq. 
Uh, Kakoshyar, would, would you please put on your video? We can't see you right now. Very good. Now we can see you. So uh, we are in different time zones. Uh, Secretary Baker is in Houston. Kakoshyar, you are in Baghdad and you're on mute. Please unmute yourself. And here I am in Washington. I will begin, Secretary Baker, by uh, asking you a question, but this is a conversation. So I invite both gentlemen to jump in whenever they want to. Secretary Baker, uh, the United State States led the international coalition that liberated Kuwait, drove Iraqi forces out of the country. It seems there was an expectation of a coup, a military coup against Saddam Hussein. What led Washington to expect a military coup and how did the expectations change and evolve and you realized that it wasn't likely to happen? Did the uprisings in Iraq take you by surprise? Uh, I don't think they took us by surprise. I will say that uh, <clears throat> uh, we never had as a war aim or a political aim uh, the, the, the removal of the Iraqi regime uh, from power. Our, our, uh, our goal, and it was the only goal, and it was the goal of the UN Security Council resolution, <clears throat> was to take Iraq uh, out of Kuwait and do so unconditionally, uh, do so by force if Iraq would not leave voluntarily. On the other hand, there was, there was uh, enormous hope on the part of many of us in the American administration that when uprisings began uh, by Shia in the South and, and Kurds in the North against the regime of Saddam Hussein, we hoped, of course, that those uprisings uh, might be successful. But it was never our uh, goal or objective or purpose to uh, uh, have as a war aim or a political aim the removal of the, uh, of the government of Iraq. Now, when, when I met with uh, uh, the foreign minister of Iraq in Geneva before the uh, opening of hostilities, uh, I said, however, that if, if Iraq were to use any of its weapons of mass destruction against our forces, that the American people would demand revenge and that that might lead to uh, a, a, the removal of the current regime in Iraq. But it was never a war aim or a political aim. Our, our unprecedented international coalition was built on the promise that uh, our sole objective was to eject Iraq from uh, Kuwait unconditionally. We hoped, of course, that there would be uprisings. We hoped that there would be an uprising within the defeated and, and embarrassed uh, Iraqi military. Thank you, Secretary Baker. Uh, I will now ask uh, Kak Hoshiar, uh, why do you think a military coup didn't take place in Iraq, but people's uprisings did? And what was the role of the Kurdish leadership at that time, both inside Kurdistan and Iraq and outside? Well, first, thank you, Bayan, for organizing this uh, meeting. And I would very much uh, like to <clears throat> welcome the participation of Secretary Baker, who is a great statement. And also he left his mark on, on, on Kurdish history by his uh, stopover for 12 minutes on the border of Shukurcha has uh, become part of our history, really. It was a turning point. Last time I met Secretary Baker was in Baghdad in 2006 uh, with the Iraq study group with uh, Lee Hamilton and many other distinguished friends. I wish him good health and uh, all the best. Thank, uh, you, thank you very much. Not at all. It's uh, good to see you again, I might say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Secretary. Uh, in fact, uh, the coup didn't happen, contrary to the expectation of many analysts at the time. After the humiliating defeat of Saddam's army in Kuwait, many people believed that uh, the army could turn against the regime and... and uh, change the regime. 
But uh, we in the opposition didn't believe that because the regime was a coup-proof regime, actually. It was established and built on that. And also many of those analysts belittled the anger and the suffering of the people of Iraq in the south, in the north, and elsewhere. And they didn't expect really such a large-scale uprising to erupt. I mean, out of 18 provinces in Iraq, nearly 14 provinces went out of the control of the regime completely. And <clears throat> this was a surprise, actually, to many officials, decision makers in the coalition. And the speed of the event actually made the... the, 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 the the victory, the quick, the military victory over Saddam Hussein in the international media, to say where is the moral victory the coalition had achieved while all the suffering is going on and all this repression. Here, the international media played a major role, really, in focusing attention on Saddam's cruelty. And finally, uh, the... The United States, France, and Britain all moved in different directions. The French were very active on the Security Council to uh, produce uh, Security Council Resolution 688. The British Prime Minister John Major was very keen to establish the safe haven uh, with the other European partner. But none of them have the mighty or the power of the United States to deliver on the ground for any operational things. And so the only uh, capable side was the United States Army, really, to, to implement. And here were the American leadership, President Bush, Secretary Baker, were in the forefront for accepting this challenge and send the troop and establish the, the, the safe haven and, in, and launch one of the most successful humanitarian operation in the history of the United Nations. The people returned back home and they provided relief and also the region stabilized. The Kurdish leadership inside was led by the Kurdistan Front with the Peshmerga. They did a lot of sacrifices and resisting the Iraqi aggression. But really, as President Barzani said, their resources were limited without the help and uh, intervention of the United States and its coalition, it was a lost cause or, or hope for the Kurds. And we in, the, in Europe, in the United States, lobbied really, I mean, through public diplomacy, through international media, to try to focus because our access to governments at the times were limited. So the only tool we had to speak to the world was through the international media, which they did a magnificent job. and. Uh, Operation Provide Comfort was a success by all measures. Thank you very much, Kakhoshiar. And, and I should uh, note that uh, Farid Yassin, Ambassador Yassin, the Iraqi ambassador in Washington, sent me a message this morning saying that we should have had somebody from the media uh, joining us today because of the significant role of the media in uh, putting the spotlight on what happened. So. Uh, Thank you for those remarks, uh, Kakoshiad. I'll turn to Secretary Baker. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you heard both uh, President Barzani and now uh, Mr. Zebari refer to you uh, arriving at uh, the border of Turkey to see the refugees for yourselves. So there were thousands of people stranded on the border along the mountains. Why did you go there yourself? What did you see and what actions uh, took place as a result? Well, we, of course, had been seeing uh, news reports <clears throat> of the developing humanitarian crisis on the border. Uh, my uh, very able assistant, Margaret Tutwiler, who was uh, head of public affairs uh, for, at the State Department when I was Secretary of State, she said, you know, this is, uh, this is an incredible humanitarian nightmare that's developing there on that border. Uh, and it would really, I, it would behoove you, I think, and, and be important for America that you go take a look at it and see what's going on and see if there's any way we could help. I was on my way to Israel, I think, uh, or, or I had a trip planned to the region. 
I remember I was going to Israel. Maybe it was when I was engaged after the first Gulf War in uh, putting together the Madrid, the Madrid Peace Conference. I was doing my shuttle diplomacy at the time. And I said, fine. And so I went to the border. Uh, I, it was a very, very uh, difficult place to get to. Uh, my airplane was a 707, the Secretary of State's airplane. There was no, no place to land that was not uh, a number of hours from the mountain uh, border between uh, Iraq and Turkey, where I was going to go. Uh, and uh, and I, I think we went, uh, I think we went to Diyarbakir, uh, Turkey, and then by vehicle uh, to, the, to the border between Iraq and Turkey. And I, I remember stepping over into uh, the territory of Iraq uh, at the time. I remember that very well. But mostly what I remember is an incredible humanitarian nightmare. I remember seeing all of these people. They didn't have sufficient shelter. They had no food. They'd cut down all the trees uh, for fires. Uh, it was. It, it looked like uh, uh, it looked like an atomic bomb had gone off. The desolation was incredible. There was no warmth from the cold nights. The tents uh, were were rather flimsy. And so, I picked up the phone and I called uh, President Bush, who of course was my close friend for forty years. I said, "Let me tell you something, Happy." I said, "You got to." huge humanitarian nightmare developing here and we have got to do something. And he quickly agreed. Uh, I urged him to call the UN Secretary General uh, to appoint a relief coordinator uh, from the UN. Uh, I, I in, uh, later on my way home, I think called uh, the Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, my friend, because the Defense Department was gonna have to be, have to. Uh, run this operation. It was huge. No, there was no other entity, I suppose, at that time in the world that could have done this, but the American uh, defense establishment. And I called Dick Cheney and I said, Dick, uh, to the extent that there are any bureaucratic uh, uh, problems here, we got to cut, we really got to cut through them. And he agreed with that. And he cut through all of the bureaucratic red tape that we might otherwise have experienced. Uh, we had a new policy announced by President Bush on April 16th that established uh, safe havens uh, for the Kurds in northern uh, Iraq and southern Turkey at that time. And then we enacted uh, the no-fly zone. Well, those were such momentous decisions. Um, and as Kakushyar said, your um, helicopter ride to the mountainside is now in part of our Kurdish history. So thank you on behalf of so many people. Kakushyar, I don't know if you want to respond to that or uh, I, I have another question for you. <laughs> no, in fact, I think uh, what the secretary has described is actually what happened. This was a very fast moving decision making process. And uh, really the, the magnitude of the calamity which the secretary saw on the borders and he uh, described uh, the, the suffering and, and his personal feeling from biblical time, as I remember his remark was, really had a major, major impact on, on, on the administration and made things to move very quickly. Um, and also the, the establishment of an international coalition of forces, I mean, Britain, France, uh, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, all sent forces uh, in order to establish that zone to reassure the people that, that there would be no Iraqi security repression of them and to encourage people to come down from the mountains to go back. And by the end of May, nearly 250,000 people return. By September, nearly a million return, in fact. So again, in the records of the UNHCR, this is the, the fastest moving exodus and the fastest moving returns of refugees, uh, which uh, demonstrate that success of, of the operation. 
And um, again, really, we are most grateful to all those who, who were a player in saving thousands of, of lives from certain death and for giving the, the people of the region uh, an opportunity for hope for a better future. You know, I think this was one of the biggest humanitarian relief operations in history. Uh, I know I wrote that in my, in my memoirs about my time as yes. uh, Secretary of State, and I devoted, I think, six or seven or eight pages to specifically just that trip to the mountains and describing, we don't have time here today for me to do this, but describing right. in detail and talking about the, the people who came up to me and talked to me uh, while we were there uh, on the mountain. And it's, uh, it, it, it was an incredible, incredibly uh, saddening scene to view. Well, a remarkable days. Um, Secretary Baker, you, as you described, and your colleagues uh, in the government were making decisions very, very quickly, which of course was necessary and had a very positive impact. But uh, launching a humanitarian military operation would normally take a lot of decision-making processes and analysis and so on. We've heard that many things went right. Thousands of lives were saved. However, are there things that, looking back, you wish had been done differently? What, well, what did I, you get right and what did you get wrong? Well, I, uh, I, I'm assuming you're asking the question about what did we get right with the, uh, with the war to kick Iraq out of Kuwait and what did we get wrong? Uh, and, and I tell people that I think uh, President Bush showed us a textbook example of the way to fight a war. You go out and you tell uh, everybody what it is you want to do, uh, and you uh, uh, and you you round up an unprecedented international coalition of nations to support you. Then you go to the Congress, even though both houses were dominated by members of the opposite political party from President Bush's political party. You go to the House and the Senate and you get support from them narrowly. Therefore, you get support from the American people. You go, you set about doing exactly what you said you're gonna do, no more and no less. And then you talk to some of the countries in the coalition, get other countries to help you pay for it. I think that's the way to fight a war. Now, those were the right things we did. And I think it was a textbook example of the way to fight a war, but we got some things wrong. And two things in particular, I think. Uh, and one is we made the mistake of letting Saddam uh, fly his helicopters in the aftermath of the surrender at Safwan. Uh, he wanted, he said he wanted to fly his helicopters to reposition his, his, his forces, I think, or uh, aid in the exodus from Kuwait. And we, uh, by mistake, let him do that. And he used those helicopters to uh, brutalize his own people, as in the example of, the, uh, uh, of, of your people in the north and the Shia in the south. The second mistake we made, in my view, was not requiring the dictator himself to come to Safwan and sign the surrender documents. So there could be no conversation about whether or not he'd been subjected to an ignominious defeat. Well, uh, President Barzani also referred to the gaps as he described it, gaps in the Safwan agreement. And then I think he meant the use of helicopters. And, and, and that Saddam didn't, didn't, wasn't required to come personally right. to sign the surrender document. We should have done that. Right. And uh, for you, Kakushyar, what do you think uh, the United States and, and others got right? Uh, what do you wish they had done differently? And what are you pleased that they did at the time? Well, the most important thing, they saved thousands of lives, really. They saved uh, the Kurdish people from uh, a clear genocide or clear calamity. 
So this in itself, the physical existence of, of a people uh, on their land was, uh, was the best achievement, I think, uh, uh, under the circumstances during uh, those historical times. I think it went right. The, the feel-good mission of, of, of the coalition force went very well. And they were satisfied, actually, from our own interaction with them that they are doing something very useful for this uh, great nations. And uh, the operation went well even after the withdrawal of the coalition forces uh, in June or July. Really, they, they left behind some mechanisms like the MCC in order to coordinate or to keep a watch on the Iraqi not to, to attack the people again. And also the no-fly zones above the 36 parallel line was, was going on. So they, they left enough or sufficient security arrangements in place to, to protect us from Saddam's atrocities and so on. So from that perspective, in fact, it was a successful uh, operation, humanitarian and even for the Kurds also to be autonomous in their areas, and that's remained until today. And we used uh, the time, in fact, to have elections, to establish our administrations, and now we have a functioning uh, government, we have uh, uh, development in our regions, we, uh, Kurdistan is the safe haven for many Iraqis who are persecuted even now or from the religious minorities and so on. So, but still the region is, is fraught with, with uncertainties, really. We, we don't know for how long. Still there are assurances for the protection of the people. We hope that this will continue. Uh, as for mistakes, uh, nobody is an angel. Everybody has made his mistakes, you see, for the lack of coordination or cooperation. But uh, I think we still highly value our strategic partner with the United States, with other uh, European countries who have stood with us steadfast, really, from the day of Operation Provide Comfort until now. And there is a great deal of goodwill to continue this policy, but maybe through different ways or different means. And uh, again, we are grateful to all those military leaders, diplomats, actually, who contributed to this successful mission. Thank you, Kako Shiar. And certainly, I think we see ourselves as friends and partners of the United States today. And uh, so I think there's a great deal that came out of that event uh, 30 years ago. We have, I think, just a few more minutes left. Uh, perhaps a last question to Secretary Baker. Uh, as Kako Shiar just mentioned, uh, there is now this uh, relationship uh, with the United States. How do you assess the situation in Kurdistan and comparing it with 30 years ago? How would you assess that? Well, I think the minister uh, described it very well. <laughs> Kurdistan is the success story of Iraq. Kurdistan is the, is the one area uh, in Iraq today uh, that, as he put it, is a refuge for others uh, who might be persecuted. It's an economic success. It's a self-governing success to a certain extent and a certain amount of autonomy. It certainly is a very good friend of the United States of America. Uh, it, it is sad to me that we don't see a similar uh, result in other parts of Iraq, uh, but we don't. Uh, that's a fact of life, but it, I think we can all take a certain amount of pride in the fact that Kurdistan, the regional government of Kurdistan has been so successful and such a steadfast friend of America and America's allies in Europe. Thank you. And Kakushyar, any uh, other points you want to raise before we Close I section. really I don't want to add anything uh, to what Secretary Baker said. I think he spoke from the heart, but I would remind him of another meeting in 1992 uh, when we joined the 
the opposition leaders to Washington and Secretary Baker received us at the time very kindly. And uh, in that meeting, I would call him really the father of this entity that has been created because uh, he, he was the one who suggested, well, why don't you seek some form of governance that will preserve the territorial integrity of Iraq, but at the same time, you could enjoy your autonomy. And he, in his remarks, suggested federalism could be a good solution. We, the United States, are a successful federal state. There are many federal states. So in that meeting, it was a turning point for all the Iraqi opposition leaders to go for that idea. So I really have nothing to add to what he said. I think he's, he spoke remarkably well and from the heart and from experience. And uh, I want to thank him again for his uh, kind remarks and wonderful remarks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister. And God bless you and all of your family. Well, thank you both. This has been a remarkable conversation. It's such an honor to be with both of you. And we thank you for your time. You're in different time zones, different continents. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I think you've given us wonderful insights into the remarkable operation, the suffering, the alleviation of that suffering and the decisions that were made that changed people's lives. Thank you, Secretary Baker. Thank you, Kakoshi Zebari. And uh, now we will turn to uh, our next speaker. I have to say that was a pretty re remarkable conversation. It feels like such a privilege to be part of it. Um, we are now going to uh, be joined from the White House by the Honorable Brett McGurk, who is the US National Security Council's coordinator for the Middle East and North Africa. Previously, Mr. McGurk served as Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and, uh, at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, many people in Kurdistan and Iraq know Brett very well. Uh, he is a, a frequent visitor, and it's a great honor, Brett, to see you today. Over to you now. Well, Bayan, thank you so much. It's just such a, a tremendous honor to be here. And uh, everybody on screen, Kakmasu, Secretary Baker, distinguished guests, it's just a remarkable, remarkable guest list. I just feel so honored to see so many friends, colleagues, important partners of the long historic relationship between the United States uh, and the Kurdish people in northern Iraq. Um, you have a lot of friends here in the new White House and uh, throughout the Biden administration, a lot of old friends who I think look very much forward. We've been connecting on the phone uh, and through video conferences through this time of COVID, but I think very soon uh, we look forward to very uh, re-engaging face-to-face. And of course, on behalf of President Biden, uh, who has such a long and personal history with Iraq and the Kurdish people, I want to express my strong support for the enduring relationship with the Kurdistan regional government and my gratitude for the Kurdish and American heroes who made Operation Provide Comfort uh, possible. Operation Provide Comfort, one of the largest humanitarian operations in the world, is an important reminder of what we can achieve when we put the bonds of humanity at the forefront of our foreign policy and lead with our values. It's very much a theme here in the Biden administration. The Iraqi Kurdish people endured untold atrocities and deprivation and yet, yet always emerged as a symbol of hope. Your heroism and perseverance through, adversi through adversity is something I've always deeply admired and of course have experienced firsthand through some very difficult moments. 30 years after that operation, what began as a humanitarian mission is now a true strategic partnership. What the Iraqi Kurdish people built from the ashes of tyranny has inspired a generation of young people in the Middle East, as we just heard from Secretary Baker. So we're honored to be your partners, not just in security cooperation, but also in building a more prosperous, democratic, and bright future for the Kurdistan region as a whole. And again, I think for everybody, I just wanna thank you so much for inviting me here. And on behalf of President Biden and the Biden administration, we're honored to be your partners. And I look forward to seeing you all again face to face, hopefully very soon. Thank you so much, Brett. That's such a powerful message uh, from the heart of the White House. It's greatly appreciated. It's good to know that we see ourselves as partners and that's exactly how you see the relationship as well. 
Thank you, Brett. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much, Maya. You're welcome. So that was great. We have a wonderful message of support delivered by Brett McGurk on behalf of President Biden and the Biden administration, describing the relationship as a strategic partnership. Now, I would like to turn to our friend and colleague at the Department of Defense. The Honorable Dana Struhl is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East. Previously, Ms. Struhl was a senior professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and had worked on Middle East issues in the Department of Defense, State Department, and various think tanks. And now, I don't see Dana on the screen, but I hope that she will be joining us very soon via Zoom. Ah, hi, Dana. <laughs> uh, please, great to see you, and thank you for joining us from the Pentagon. Over to you. Thank you so much, Bayan. And, and just like uh, Brett, it is such an honor to be uh, part of this distinguished guest list on this really important day. So let me uh, greet everybody here on behalf of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. It is an honor to be with you representing the U.S. Department of Defense as we commemorate the 30th anniversary of Operation Provide Comfort. This is an occasion to reflect on that historic undertaking and what it says about the bonds between our two people, a partnership that remains strong and essential to this day, and just to echo what Brett said, strategic, a strategic partnership. When Operation Provide Comfort commenced 30 years ago this month, it was the largest humanitarian operation the world had ever seen. The U.S.-led combined task force that carried it out at one point was composed of more than 20,000 people. In the first 20 days of the operation alone, U.S. Air Force C-5s and C-141s, massive planes weighing hundreds of thousands of pounds, flew 75 missions across the Atlantic, transporting life-saving relief supplies. In the first three months of this operation, the Air Force transported over 7,000 tons of supplies to the Kurdish people of northern Iraq. It was a heroic effort supported by over a dozen allied and partnered countries from around the world. We remember and honor these brave servicemen and women. But it was also at its heart, a response to the heroism of the Iraqi Kurdish people, a recognition of the immense courage of the Kurdish people in rising up against Saddam Hussein's tyranny and the immense hardship endured by hundreds of thousands forced to take shelter on frigid mountains in an attempt to protect their loved ones from his brutal response. The United States responded by doing what we do best, rallying a coalition of like-minded allies and partners that came together to help the brave Kurdish people in their hour of need. And in the time since then, we have also learned firsthand what brave partners you all are today when everything has been on the line and we have stood up to face danger together. The 12 year anniversary of Operation Provide Comfort saw Kurdish and American forces again fighting side by side, ultimately ending the reign of Saddam Hussein for good. The 24 year anniversary saw them fighting side by side to defeat the brutal aspirations of Daesh, against whom Kurdish forces defend, uh, defended a nearly 650 mile front that included the very same territory US planes once circled to keep Saddam Hussein's forces at bay. And now, three decades after that operation, the bond forged between our peoples remains and the partnership between our armed forces is stronger than ever. Today, U.S. and coalition forces advise, equip, assist, and enable the Peshmerga as they take the lead to fight against Daesh in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. This critical work contributes to the stability and security of Iraq, the region, and indeed the entire world. So again, on behalf of the Department of Defense, I am proud to partner with you all, just as we were proud to stand with you shoulder and sh to shoulder in 1991. Again, thank you so much for the chance to join you all on this historic occasion. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dana Struhl from the Pentagon. We really appreciate you joining us. 
And thank you for those powerful messages. Uh, you talked about the bond, the strategic partnership, and the courage of the people to rise up against Saddam Hussein. And uh, I know we have many friends at the Department of Defense. So thank you very much, Dana, and our best wishes to you and all of your colleagues. Thank you. Well, uh, it's such an honor to hear from uh, our friends at the White House and the Department of Defense. And I think this underscores the strong relationship that we have with the United States. So now we are coming to the final segment of uh, this occasion. And as I said earlier, we will hear from three remarkable men, General John Abizade, General Jay Garner, and General Jim Jones. I will just introduce them briefly before we begin the conversation. General John Abizade is a retired United States four-star general who most recently served as the United States ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. General Jay Garner is also a retired United States Army Lieutenant General who served as the director of the Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance for Iraq in 2003. He was the commanding general of the Joint Task Force Bravo, Operation Provide Comfort, in 1991. General Jim Jones is a retired United States Marine Corps four-star general who served as the United States National Security Advisor to President Barack Obama from 2009 to 2010. As I said, three remarkable gentlemen, it's a great honor to have all three of them join us from completely different parts of the United States. And <clears throat> in fact, General Ghana is in Kurdistan right now. But before we uh, speak to the three generals, I would like us to just look at some photographs that were taken by the United States military of Operation Provide Comfort. We're grateful to General Jim Jones who allowed us access to his archive so that we could share some of these photographs with you today. So now let's go to the slideshow. So again, with thanks to General Jim Jones for allowing us access to his archives. And uh, we couldn't find out the name of the photographer who took those pictures, but uh, a big thank you to them as well. So uh, now we should have with us um, General Abizade, who's joining us from Nevada, General Jones, who I believe is in the Washington area, and General Garner, who is joining us from Erbil. 
Uh, first question to General Abizaid. Um, you and your colleagues were tasked with delivering aid, a humanitarian operation, but at the same time, you had to keep Iraqi forces in check. So how did you manage both, both uh, a soft power mission, the humanitarian side, and then being tough guys with the Iraqi military to keep them away? Over to you, General Abizaid. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, and it's great to be here with my two former bosses, Marine Corps General James Jones and Jay Garner, U.S. Army. Uh, with two bosses like that, you could do anything. They would tell you how to do it. Uh, they would give you plenty of rope to hang yourself. And then they'd say, you've got my intent, go do it. So uh, with a chain of command like we had from General Shalikashvili at the top to General Garner uh, leading the operational activity to General Jones leading the tactical activity, um, you had plenty of room to maneuver. You know, my, my battalion's mission was to provide the shield for the humanitarian work to get done. I, I could never forget the first time we showed up in Kurdistan. Here it is like uh, the mountains of Nevada where I live, where it's very high mountains, very cold temperatures. And the first night we spent sleeping on the ground, we woke up with two inches of snow on us. So I was very happy when General Jones said, move out go towards the hood. Um, but what we found there was a wonderful cooperation, not only with our colleagues from the international community, but in particular from the Peshmerga and from the Kurdish people. Once we understand that, understood that our mission was saving lives and creating opportunity, um, we knew that we couldn't go wrong. So telling the Iraqis to leave wasn't a hard thing to do. Making them leave wasn't a hard thing to do because with Peshmerga, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Marine Corps, all of the support of the United States of America and our allies, there was no place for the Iraqis to go except the other side of the line of Kurdistan. Well, thank you for that. And uh, as we've been hearing throughout the, this event, all of these steps, decisions had uh, were, were very momentous and, and we're still reaping the benefits of those decisions today and those actions. I'll turn now to General Jay Garner. Uh, General Garner, you and I have spoken about Operation Provide Comfort before, and uh, you recently mentioned that as you were leaving Kurdistan, uh, the, your mission had ended and you were leaving, you looked back and, and you thought to yourself that the Kurds didn't stand a chance. Can you just explain that? Why did you think that? And, and what do you think now? Well, first of all, may I, let me thank you for inviting me to be here. And I, as John Abizé said, uh, the, best, the best part of this for me is being on two of my best friends, Jim Jones and John Abizé. And I want to wish you greetings, you two fine generals greetings, and also wish greetings to Kurds everywhere. Bless you, all of you Kurds. Thank you for being our most loyal allies and our most loyal friends in this entire region. You know, Provide Comfort was the most gratifying experience I had in 42 years of wearing a uniform. And uh, I'm gonna to get to your question in a minute, man. The, the, th the th three things I walked away from this from, three things that I learned from the Kurds. Um, and there were three attributes that I think all nations should have. The first one is from 1991 until today, this day. <clears throat> the courage and the determination of, of the Iraqi people is incredible. And what they did through their determination and their willingness to overcome hardship, dangers, threats, all those things, they were able to build this nation. And they did it on the broad shoulders and the leadership of Kop and Sud Brazani. And they, they still, fortunately, still have that leadership. The other thing they did is they've created here in this, in this land, a lasting place, safe haven for Christians and other minorities, and they take care of it. And the final thing that I, I got from them is the loyalty and the support that they always have had for the United States. They never forgot us and many times we forgot them. They always supported us and many times we haven't supported them. So I guess the three things I walked away from, from the Kurdish people, 
One, perseverance. Two, mercy. And three, loyalty. And all of us across the world could have those three attributes and be a better world. And going back to your question, when, when Jim Jones and John Abizade and I walked across Harbor Bridge into Turkey, and we turned around and we looked back, and we all had fallen in love with Kurt. And I turned to them and I said, there's no way they can make it. What you had in Kurdistan then, you had over 4,000, over 4,000 destroyed villages, probably closer to 5,000. Uh, no running water, no electricity. Uh, Dahut had been shot up, Zaku had been shot up. Uh, no economy, roads were terrible. There's no way you can survive. You can't overcome those. So if you go from that point, to where we are today, and you have four or five star hotels, great restaurants, great roads, vibrant economy, good super education system, uh, a good economy. There's troubles in Kurdistan, just like there is in every nation, but a very vibrant country it is right now. If, if you go from that point in 91 to this point where they are right now in, in uh, 2021, I don't think you'll find another example in world history where a group of people have gone that far, that fast. It's amazing. I wish everybody could come here and just look at what's around here. And I wish they could see what it looked like in 91 and what it looks like now. It is absolutely incredible. So I think what happened is, I think Jim Jones and John Abizade and myself all walked out. We were the same people that came there to start, but there's one difference in us, is when we walked out, we still had our American bodies. But what we gained is a Kurdish heart. And that stayed with us ever since then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your Kurdish heart. <laughs> and uh, gentlemen, I don't know if you saw President Barzani's message earlier. He uh, greeted all three of you and your friend Colonel Nab as well and thanked you uh, for what you had done. And now I'll, I'll turn to General Jim Jones. And uh, I was remiss in not mentioning General Jones uh, it was, is the former commandant, United States Marine Corps, former Supreme Allied Commander Europe, and the former National Security Advisor to the US President. So General Jones, uh, you and I have also spoken many times about Operation Provide Comfort. One of the things that sticks in my mind from our conversations is when you have said that in all of your very long military career, Operation Provide Comfort was one of the most rewarding experiences. Please, can you just tell us why you, you think that? What, what is it that you remember to share that thought with us? Well, thank you very much uh, for the privilege of uh, being with uh, such a distinguished group of people and, and great friends that, uh, that uh, we've made over many, many years and remain uh, close uh, today, largely as a result of the experience of Provide Comfort. Um, you know, I think that, um, as Secretary Baker pointed out, that this, this was the largest humanitarian operation uh, in history, I think, uh, up, up to that point. Um, but one of the things that has stayed with me over the years is the impact that it had on everybody who participated. And not only was it uh, uh, a humanitarian operation, but it was really one of the first times where humanitarian side of the house uh, had all the supplies and the food and, and need and necessary for the for the people that were up in the mountains, but, and we had the transportation. And so the first um, of effort, I think, with humanitarian groups and uh, the military, which kind of always looked at each other uh, a little askance uh, over the years. But, but that partnership uh, really was something that was uh, extraordinary. Um, one of the things that uh, stayed with me, uh, and which is why I said what I've said many times about this being one of the most defining experiences of my life, was um, when we were on the way home in the ships uh, crossing the Atlantic after the operation was terminated, I made it a point to 
to go and talk to all the troops on, on the ships um, to not only thank them for everything they had done, but also to gauge what kind of uh, impression they had as a result of that uh, experience in Operation Provide Comfort. And uh, at the end of each talk that I gave, I asked uh, for a show of hands. And I, the question I put to them was, we've been gone uh, over eight months. Normally, it's a six-month deployment. Uh, we're now going home. We're halfway across the Atlantic. If, if, uh, if, if tomorrow it came to be that Saddam Hussein was invade, re-invading uh, uh, Kurdistan, how many of you would volunteer to go back? turn around right now and turn the ships around and go back. And uh, unanimously, every hand went up. Uh, and these are young, young Marines, old Marines, uh, sailors that participated with us. Uh, it, was really, uh, it was really at that point, at that time, at that event, when I really realized what a life-changing experience uh, Operation Provide Comfort was. And, and how much it meant to uh, everyone who was, a, who was privileged to participate in that uh, operation. And it, that, that feeling continues to this day. Well, thank you so much, General Jones. Uh, I'd say that for the people of Kurdistan, of course, it was a huge turning point, but it's always gratifying to hear from you, from General Garner and General Abizade, that for you also, it was memorable. Um, I'm now going to throw out a question and whoever would like to take, the, take it, take a stab at it, please feel free. Um, just tell us a little bit more about what it was like. You were young, young Americans in the military uh, sent to this far off land, having to deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of people who were in a desperate situation, pushing back on the Iraqi military. Just give us some idea of what it was like on the ground from your perspective. And as I said, that question is open to whoever would like to start. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, if you'd like. Um, the, um, so when we reported into Operation Provide Comfort in Iskenderun in, uh, in Turkey, uh, our, our orders were to proceed to uh, Salopi, uh, Turkey, and um, link up with a humanitarian effort to, to try to start uh, bringing supplies to the thousands of people who were stranded in the heights of the Tur southern Turkish mountains. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, we also crossed over the river into Zako. Uh, and... Um, and, and I remember, you know, going into Zako, and which was virtually deserted, with the exception of some small minorities that, that, that stayed behind. And um, one of the one of the things that we did was to set up a, a reverse osmosis water purification unit in the going down to the river, and uh, uh, giving the people who really didn't have any any uh, fresh water. Uh, access to fresh water, and they queued up. Uh, everyone that was in Zako queued up to get to get that water. The next morning, uh, we expected to see uh, again a line of people lining up for fresh water. Nobody came, and um, it took a little while to figure out why. And and the why was that the uh, secret uh, police uh, of Saddam Hussein had put the word out that anybody who went to the water point uh, would be shot. And uh, so nobody came. And that's when we, we figured out that uh, there was a secret police uh, headquarters inside the town and of course the Iraqi army outside the town. And uh, with General Garner and uh, the UK Royal Marines, we conducted an operation to, uh, let's, shall we say, politely invite the secret police to leave town and never come back. And that was the kind of the beginning of the, this uh, rollback of the Iraqi forces to within 30 kilometers of where, wherever we were operating. And, and, and then the happy end of that story was that people came to get their water and without any fear from that point on. But that to me was one of the, one of the starting points of, of the operation from, from my standpoint. 
Right. General Abizé, General Ghana, did you want to add anything? Well, sure. I, I would like to add that uh, it was truly remarkable uh, once we came to the decision that we had to move out of the Zako area and establish an enclave that went as deep as the hook. So we went from a period where uh, the towns and the cities were deserted uh, to all of a sudden people coming back from the mountain, but also the Peshmerga came back down from the mountains armed and ready to fight. And not only was it important for us to be able to move to expand the borders of the Kurdistan Autonomous Region, uh, but we also had to move the Iraqis out. And once we had made that decision, it was a remarkable series of events of maneuver, not only with us, but also with the Peshmerga, uh, the other allied forces that were in the region in an effort to continue to expand the area without causing too much bloodshed. Uh, there were a lot of very tense times, a lot of difficult times. It's important to note that we lost soldiers there. We'll never forget their sacrifice. Uh, but I just like to say, you know, the, the thing that I learned most about Kurdistan is that the Kurdish people will forever be our brothers and sisters. We work together as friends, we work together as colleagues, we work together as soldiers, we work together in an effort to make a small part of the world a better place. And to see and look back 30 years later, to see how vibrant, how capable, how completely stable the region has become, we could only wish that that would happen to the rest of Iraq. And later when I became the CENTCOM commander, who was it that we turned to when we needed help to help with the stabilization of Iraq writ large? We turned to our Kurdish friends. Never did they refuse us. Never did they turn their back on us. The level of support, admiration, and cooperation is in my many years of service to the nation, remarkable and unique. And we'll never forget our Kurdish brothers and sisters for what they provided. Well, thank you, General. That's very moving. And uh, certainly, uh, I think fr from our perspective, we do look to the United States for leadership, for uh, the values that we share, human rights, religious freedom, women's empowerment. And I think we've heard from so many people today about the bond that was created back in 91. General Garner, did you want to add anything here? Yeah, man. I would. Yeah, the, one of the things that, that struck me really emotionally the whole time there were, was the children. And um, they, the conditions were horrible. They were just terrible. But the children were always cheerful. And you get the Marines and soldiers around them, and they would laugh, and they'd try to play with them. The soldiers and Marines would play back with them. And the children were always just a very vibrant part of everything that was going on in provided comfort. And so I, it just stuck with me the whole time we were there, just how uplifting all the children were and how uplifting the, the, the Kurdish people were and how resilient they were with all the, the chaos that was going on. And I give you a story when, uh, when, we, were, when we were leaving, um, this Kurdish boy ran out of the crowd and he handed me a, a folder, a manila folder. And I took that and I handed it back to my radio operator and said, hold on this. And we got to the other side and, and uh, we, we parted, Jim and John and I parted, and I stayed there another couple of weeks over in, uh, in Salute. And that night I was in my tent, and uh, Jimmy Bailey, the radio operator that I handed this to, came and said, hey, hey, boss, did you, did you look at this? I said, no, I didn't have to. He said, look at this. And it was four drawings, very well done, by a 10-year-old boy. And each drawing was the picture of soldiers and Marines with children and the children are laughing and they're happy and the soldiers are throwing them up in the air and all this stuff. So they had his name there and I said, okay, get the helicopter more. We're going to fly back over and we're going to find this young man. We're going to talk to him and I'm going to talk to his mother and father and I'm going to give him a point. So I got hold of my Kurdish 
Kurdish counterpart, Fala Morani, and I said, Father, look at these pictures and tell me about this boy. He said, oh, I know the boy. He said, I know the family. The family's dead. He said, they all got gas. And he said, he's living over the farm, over the pharmacy in Zaku with his aunt and uncle. So I went and we flew in the next day and I went and met them. I gave him a coin. I thanked him. And that night I came back and looked at those pictures. And I said, here's a kid, 10-year-old kid, that every moment in his life up to that, if you see somebody in uniform, you better run. You better run fast because nothing good is going to happen. And after just two, three, four months with the Western forces, with the U.S. Army and Marines, and the Marines from, the, from, from Britain and the paratroopers from Spain and France and the, the Pole Guard we gave from it all that. His whole outlook had changed that, that the military is good. And I said, what an incredible statement of the type of government and the type of lives that we have in the western part of the western part of this world. Uh, that we can go into a place like that and everybody loves us when we leave. And of course we loved all them. I think that's one of the most memorable things. Thank you. It's a very sweet story. And I wonder if that 10 year old boy is watching you right now <laughs> right so um i'd like to perhaps i don't know if this is going to be too political a question but what do you think went wrong um there must have been some decisions that were made uh either by regional powers by washington by the kurds by iraq We've heard so much about the success of Operation Provide Comfort, but nothing is perfect. What are things that, looking back, you wish had been done differently? Well, I, let, let me answer that or be the first one to. I, I think that everything in Provide Comfort went extremely well. You had very professional military there. All, all the forces there were elite forces. I mean, you had paratroopers and Marines. Um, the, the one thing with me when I left that, that, that had disheartened me is that we couldn't go further south. We, were, we weren't allowed to go any further than, uh, than Dahoud. And I, I was wishing that we could have gone down to Mosul and Erbil and Suleimani and, and had that straight line from the Syrian border to the, to the Iranian border. And I think the reason not, that we weren't allowed to do that, I, I think that the... Uh, the nations involved thought that would be, that was too far. That would be too threatening to Saddam Hussein, and it might engender another another conflict in doing that. But I wish that we had been able to go further. But all in all, I think what came out of that was the autonomous zone, which which has caused uh, been part of the reason outside of the Kurdish leadership and Kurdish people, been part of the reason for uh, for this vibrant community, this vibrant uh, population to rise up again. Thank you. General Abbasay, General Jones, would you like to have a stab at that? I'll defer to General Abbasay. I was hoping that General Jones would take that one on. <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I just want to underscore what, what General Garner said. You know, there was an opportunity there. There were political constraints. There was an opportunity to turn the political constraints into a much more favorable position for the United States and for our allies had we been allowed to continue to move further south. Uh, there was an unnerving effect on the Iraqi army. Without firing a shot, essentially, we broke the Iraqi army in the north. That gave us an opportunity that had we been prepared to take it, could have made a whole different future, not only for Kurdistan, but for Iraq. Uh, like General Garner said, there's, there's hard uh, evidence that, that shows um, that this operation was one of the, the best we've had in the United States ever, where we had a limited objective and we were very successful. But expanding that objective somewhat, I think could have made a better, better difference. Uh, but overall, I was extremely su supportive of what had happened. And as a soldier, I'd never have had a, a better experience than that operation with these two great generals as my bosses. Well, that's very kind, uh, very kind of you, John. Thank you so much. Uh, but you know, the, if you look at the composition of the international force that, that 
worked in uh, JTF Alpha and JTF Bravo. We were all colonels and lieutenant colonels and, uh, you know, much, much younger. Uh, but the astonishing uh, uh, promotions that uh, came out as a result of this for for, for many, uh, many people in the French army, the Italians, the Dutch, uh, the British, uh, really a lot, a lot of the leaders went on to become uh, big players in their own countries and in the NATO and, and so on and so forth. So it was really a, a proving ground that taught us a lot, of, a lot about uh, modern conflict and, and the various um, challenges that go along with uh, doing an operation like this. I, uh, I think, um, you know, I think, I think back on it a lot is, is one of the most uh, defining moments of certainly in my career. And one of the things that has given me more satisfaction than, than just about anything else I've ever done. Um, and uh, getting to know, getting to work for, for General Garner. And I, I, I would also uh, like to mention General Shali Kashvili, uh, uh, as our as our leader, uh, who really put his heart and soul into the effort uh, for coordinating the activities of both uh, Joint Task Force Alpha on the Turkey side of the border and the Joint Task Force Bravo. Um, there's no secret that uh, I think John Abizade and General Gardner and I wanted to go a little bit further south uh, than the hook. <laughs> Uh, I think we did go a little bit further south. Than <laughs> I was going to say, we actually did go further We actually south. did that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I think that was, uh, I think General Shally conveyed his displeasure at that. But, um, <laughs> but, but it, uh, it, it was nonetheless uh, an indication that uh, we wanted to make sure that the Iraqi army was not in a position to interfere with the uh, the homecoming, so to speak, of all of the refugees into the, the big city of the Hook. And I, uh, I have, I've, I've, I've been there since then, and I echo General Garner's thoughts that it's uh, astonishing to see the progress that, uh, that's been made in the peaceful conditions that people uh, uh, are living in. So very proud to have been a part of it. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, we're into the very last few minutes uh, of our program. Um, I have one question. We, we're getting so many questions through our audience who have joined us on Zoom, uh, but a lot of them really are around protecting Kurdistan today. And if you saw President Barzani's uh, message earlier, he did end by saying that great things were achieved but today Kurdistan faces many threats and that he asked, he asked that protecting Kurdistan should still be a priority. How do you think the United States and perhaps other partners can really help to protect Kurdistan from these challenges and threats that we face today? General Ghana, you're in Erbil, you're in Kurdistan. What would yeah, you say? And, and, I, and I just had a long talk with the, with the Kak Masood and uh, Kak Nechavan and Kak Masuri yesterday about this very subject. And I think I think it, uh, that there, there's two things to consider there. Number one, when you attack, uh, you respond with force. And thus far in the attacks on Erbil and elsewhere here in the, in the north, uh, we haven't responded with force. Uh, and I think that gives the wrong signal to both our, El our Arab allies and it gives the wrong signal to the uh, to the Iranians, so I think it, I hope my hope that in the future that, that we'll decide to to, uh, to really defend. And I think that if we if we defend there, we're not just defending Kurds. We have U.S. servicemen here, a lot of them, and so we're defending them also. So I, what I'd like to see is is for us to change our, our whatever our policy is right now here and, and bring in the right type of weapons and equipment to defend both our people and the Kurds and then respond to every attack. General Abbasay, General Jones, if you want to answer <laughs> that or any final remarks before we close. I, I, I think uh, from a strategic standpoint, it, it's really, really important that um, the United States uh, remain uh, 
present and visible. Um, one of the goals being to prevent the, the Iranians from uh, unfettered access uh, from Tehran to the to the to the sea uh, to, to Lebanon. Actually, um, that's one of their goals. I think is to <coughs> excuse me is to uh, have that corridor intact um, so they can continue their uh, their ways of exporting terrorism and, and unrest uh, throughout the region. Uh, and I think that, that uh, the United States and hopefully an allied presence uh, in that region will prevent them from doing that. I think that's extraordinarily important. And that goes hand in hand with uh, protecting uh, Kurdistan from that kind of uh, intrusion. I guess I would uh, add as a, as a final thought from, from my point of view, having just served as, as ambassador to Saudi Arabia for two years, you, you know, there's a remarkable transformation going on inside Saudi Arabia. And the transformation of Saudi Arabia is about economic transformation. It's about empowering people. It's an opportunity to live a better life. But the example that has been set by the autonomous region of Kurdistan for the rest of the Middle East should not be unnoticed by anyone. It is so important to have stability somewhere in the Middle East. And when I think of Kurdistan being between the, the deadly forces of ISIS extremism and the IRGC extremism, it becomes a hugely strategic important region, not only for the United States, but for all the people of the region. Sectarianism is the curse of the Middle East. What the Kurds have shown us is that you can live and prosper and move forward for a better future if you're willing to defend yourself, but also if you have good partners to help you defend yourself. So it is so important in my view that we do everything that we can uh, to continue our strong relationship with the Kurdish people and do what we can to keep this island of stability strong and prosperous. Thank you so much. Uh, that's exactly our hope. I think the people of Kurdistan <laughs> have achieved a great deal over the past three decades, uh, but uh, we need to ensure that it is protected and that it can continue to flourish. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been such an honor to speak to all three of you. Uh, it's a real privilege. Thank you for what you did in Operation Provide Comfort and for your friendship today. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you, Patrick. Thank you very Thank much. You. And so this concludes our program today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us wherever you are especially if you're joining us from Kurdistan. I would like to thank all of our speakers. Of course, His Excellency President Masoud Barzani, it was a great honor to receive his message. Kakosh Zebari, Secretary James Baker, uh, Brett McGurk from the White House, Dana Struhl from the Department of Defense, and the three generals, General Abizaid, Jones, and Ghana, who joined us. I would also like to, start, uh, to thank the staff of the Department of Foreign Relations who have helped us bring together this program and especially Kak Safin, Safin Dezay, the head of the Department of Foreign Relations. I would also like to thank Rudal who have been our media partner for this event. And last but not least, I would like to thank the Kurdistan Regional Government representation staff here in the United States. We're a small team, but we try to do our best. And most of all, I would like to thank all of you who have joined us today to mark this remarkable occasion. From here in Washington, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>